You are listening to episode four of Attila the Hun on Villains and Virgins podcast. You can get the audio version of this podcast anywhere you enjoy streaming your podcasts, or you can get the illustrated version on my YouTube channel or even on my Instagram at Eva Schubert. We're picking up our story where we left off, because in episode three, there was an imperial princess who begged Attila to save her from a life of boredom and a terrible marriage that she had no interest in. But inadvertently, she would provide the pretext for Attila the Hun to bring a massive army into Europe, causing fear in both the imperial western capital in Ravenna, where she lived, and the eastern one as well, simultaneously. Attila the Hun is used to getting his way, and he's very good at compelling people to do what he wants them to do. But this year, he's made two important demands that he has received a refusal for. The Eastern Empire has suddenly ceased their annual payments of gold in exchange for peace. And At the same time, the Western Empire has just refused Attila's demand that they hand over Princess Honoria to be one of his wives, and with her, half of the Western Empire as a dowry. So he's been denied on both counts, and by the time he receives word from the Eastern Empire that the gold isn't coming, Attila's army is probably already in the force of Germany. Their home base is in Hungary, it's in Central Europe, and Attila controls a vast swath of land that stretches an enormous distance, but he's on the move and he's bringing a larger army than he's ever assembled before. He's heading west. But Attila has a problem. His armies are uniquely equipped for battle on the open plains of Eastern Europe. That's where they maneuver, that's where they train, that's where they live. And so they are perhaps better than any other army in the field at that time at meeting another army in that terrain and destroying them. But Attila is taking this army with its formidable mounted archers, their speed, their horsemanship, and he's taking them now into a totally different geographic terrain. He's going to be going through dense forested areas, and he's going to be passing fortified cities. Cities that they can't afford to pass by, because if they do, they run the risk of troops that are in those cities coming out after they've passed and attacking them from behind. So Attila is going to have to contend with different conditions for travel and fighting, and he's also going to have to travel with siege machinery. Because as fantastic as Hunnish archers are, they're not going to demolish stone city walls. For that, you need very special siege machines. And the problem with those is that they tend to slow you down. You have to lug these things for miles and miles behind your horses or your oxen or whatever with your army so that you have the tools that you need with you when you happen to arrive at one of these fortified cities. Despite the slower pace at which the Hunnish army is compelled to travel with all this unaccustomed gear, they're still making incredible progress with the speed that the Huns have become notorious for. They have this reputation for showing up when they're least expected and traveling ahead of the news. So long before the rumor arrives that they might be headed your way, they've already arrived on your doorstep and destroyed your city. The Hunnish army storms across Germany, past a number of frightened towns that offer very little resistance, heading towards the province of Gaul, which was a Roman province, and most of that province is located within what we now call France. Those of you who are familiar with the fantastic Asterix and Obelix cartoon series will know all about the Roman stay in Gaul and how long it went on and how difficult it was. Now, one example from the passage of the Hunnish army through Germany is an excellent illustration of the amount of fear that they must have inspired. The Hunnish army arrives at the gates of a city called Trier, which lies in modern Germany. It's almost at the border of Belgium, and it's spitting distance from France. It was also a garrison town for the occupying Roman army in the province of Gaul. Trier had a massive fortress that was part of the city compound, and it had blocks that were part of that fortress wall, which weighed up to six tons. 
The building was three stories high and the walls were 22 meters thick. So it was virtually impregnable. The amount of time it would take you to try and batter through those walls and gain entrance would have been far too costly for most armies to contemplate, simply because the number of men you would lose while you were trying to attack these incredibly strong fortifications would be very high because the defenders of this fortress could rain down arrows and pitch and, all, and stones and all sorts of terrible things. So the attrition rate of the invading army would be incredibly high while trying to break through walls that were this strong. This fortress was actually built around the entrance of the city, which also had a portcullis gate. And for those of you who are medieval history nerds, you'll know that the portcullis is that crisscross spiky gate that descends down to block the entrance of a city. So it was incredibly well defended and should have been very easy for the garrison that lived in that fortress to defend. Trier should have been a very costly place for Attila and his army to invade. But somehow, this never happened. The Huns passed by this city with barely a pause, and the only explanation for them doing that is that the city must have offered no resistance, no arrows, no show of military force. If the garrison inside the fortress had fired at the army outside the gates, the army would have had to mount an attack to prevent themselves from being vulnerable to attack from that garrison later on from behind. So imagine the barbarian horde, the countless horsemen and soldiers of Attila's army swelling around the outside of the city of Trier like a sea and passing by it. The inhabitants inside locked their gates and prayed for grace. Attila's army passed on, deeper into the Roman province of Gaul. The town of Metz was not so lucky. When Attila's army arrived there, they attacked the gates of the city with a battering ram for days. The gates seemed immovable, so Attila's army moved downriver some miles to find an easier point of entrance to attack. And while they were there, they received word in the middle of the night that part of the wall near the gates of the city that they had been attacking earlier had crumbled, presumably weakened by their earlier assault. And so, with their characteristic speed, Attila's horsemen wheel around in the middle of the night and ride full speed for the gates of the city, which are now vulnerable for them to enter. Many of the city's inhabitants died that night some by having their throats cut in their own beds, and others died by fire as their houses were lit around them. The survivors in the city would have told that story to anyone who would listen, further increasing the terror that the Hunnish advance would have as they made their way into Europe. Now you might wonder, it makes sense for Attila and his army to be killing soldiers that are trying to defend these cities. But what's the point of killing civilians who are sleeping in their beds or who just happen to be living in the town? It seems unnecessary, cruel, uh, barbaric, if you like. But it made a certain amount of very good sense. When Attila's army arrived at a city, if they did these terrible things, there would be enough survivors for word of that to travel. And that meant that when they arrived at another city, their chances of being able to take what they needed without a fight were that much higher. People were very anxious to make terms or surrender rather than suffer the fate that resisting cities had already endured. The Hunnish army next came to the town of Reims. It's a major city in modern-day France and was the central city in the existing Roman province of Gaul. But they found the city eerily silent. Most of the population had fled into the woods. Those who had wealth or valuables had buried them in the ground and fled the city. The only people left were the archbishop, a few priests, and a handful of devout inhabitants who were praying for God's grace or some sort of miracle to save them. Only the archbishop, some priests, and a handful of devout inhabitants remained in the city, praying for divine protection. Some legends claim that the Bishop of Reims was in the church itself when the Huns entered the city, and that he was on his knees at the altar reciting Psalm 119, which happens to be the longest of the Psalms. He was in the middle of verse 25, which reads, 
My soul cleaveth to the dust. Quicken thou me according to thy word. When he was decapitated by a Hunnish swordsman. Legends tend to be dramatic and they tend to have these sorts of events happen at just the right moment. But there's a certain irony in the Archbishop being in the middle of this verse, which speaks of utter despair, which speaks of being so afraid that one is is already in the dust as though death were imminent, and at this point praying for God's grace, and for this to be the very moment when, instead of grace, a Hunnish soldier arrives bearing death on the edge of his blade. Many of the remaining residents of the city would have met the same fate, and the Hunnish army then spurred their horses west toward Orléans. Not far away, residents of the city of Paris are preparing to evacuate their homes. You see, nobody knows which city the Hunnish army is going to show up at next. It's not as though the people in, in Gaul have his plans and know which route he's planning to take or where he's ultimately going to end up. All they have are rumors that the Hunnish army has recently destroyed Rheem or some other town or been spotted here or there. And for all they know, their city might be next. And so, wanting to be spared the fate that they've already heard so much about, you, you can imagine families packing their bags hastily and preparing to flee their homes and run into the hills or the forests anywhere they can to hide until the army is safely past the city. Now, in the city is a young woman named Genevieve, who's quite unusual and whose reputation is going to live long after she does. Now, Genevieve was originally born to a noble family, but in her youth she's become a religious ascetic. So basically this means she embraces a life of piety, of prayer, uh, she's going to be living celibately, and spending most of her time in exercises of devotion to God. Apparently she also tended sheep, which would have been quite a different occupation than what she was likely born into, but something that she probably embraced because of the humility and the poverty associated with it. Now, although Genevieve was young, and although she was a woman, both of which would have put her in a lower social status than many other people in that village, she claimed to see divine visions and to be able to foretell the future. And this gave her a greater status than you might expect. People would turn to her, they would ask her to pray, they would ask her what she saw. And it was at this moment of crisis in the city of Paris that Genevieve raised her voice and she told the people of that city not to flee. She told the people that the Huns were invading Europe because of their sins, and that the answer was not to flee, but to beg God for forgiveness and for grace and protection from this terrible punishment that was coming in the form of a barbarian army. Now, at first, no doubt people ignored this as they were busy packing their bags, but the story has it that the women of Paris began to listen to Genevieve, and they said that they were going to stay, that they were going to pray, that they were going to implore the grace of God and the power of Genevieve's intercession, and they were going to take the risk. The fact that the women were staying shamed some of their husbands into staying as well, because what sort of a man flees the city and runs for the hills, leaving his wife and their children behind to face God knows what sort of fate? So slowly Genevieve turned the tide, and the people of Paris mostly stayed. Fortunately, the Huns never arrived in Paris. Now, some say that's because Paris was never part of Attila's intended route anyway, but for the people of Paris it seemed like a miracle, like an answer to their prayer, and it seemed that the grace of God had protected them from what would have been a terrible fate. So Genevieve became the patron saint of the city of Paris. She's still known as Saint Genevieve to this day, perhaps part of a long tradition of French female saints protecting cities and their country from invaders. So it was during this invasion, as Christian towns in Europe grew weak with fear, that Attila earns perhaps his most compelling nickname. When he arrived at the gates of the city of Troy, Attila was met by the bishop of the city who had been sent out to negotiate terms with Attila and the army. 
the bishop was bravely attempting to negotiate to avoid the destruction of his city. And when he comes before Attila, he introduces himself by name and says, I am a man of God. At this point, Attila is supposed to have replied very rapidly, and I am Attila, the scourge of God. A scourge, of course, is an old-fashioned word for a whip, something that was used as an instrument of torture and punishment. So Attila, in this story, defines himself as God's tool of punishment for the cities in Europe. Did Attila actually say this? We don't know. We certainly know that people in Europe did regard him as a tool of God's punishment, and they may well have told this story to illustrate what they already believed to be true. But regardless of whether Attila used this word himself, it certainly would have put a smile on his face, and it is an accurate reflection of how other people saw him. The Bishop of Troy did succeed in saving his city from destruction and invasion, but only at the cost of remaining with the Hunnish army as a personal hostage until such time as they decided he was no longer useful and might let him go. So you have to ask at this point, where are the Roman armies? How is it that Attila is able to charge through Germany and into France, encountering only the cities that are in his path with the meager amounts of resistance that they're capable of offering? Well, there was a Roman imperial army that was ready and waiting to face Attila. The problem was they didn't know exactly where to meet him. Atias, who we've met before in this story, was in charge of the Western Imperial Army. Now, you will have heard of him if you've listened to episode two or three, but in case you haven't, Atias was unique amongst Romans because as a teenager, he had been sent as a diplomatic guest or polite hostage to live with the Huns for several years. This meant that he had personally met Attila, he knew Hunnish language, he knew their culture, he knew their battle tactics. Furthermore, he's had a personal relationship with the Huns ever since, and on more than one occasion, he's come to them for help, to ask uh, to hire some of their warriors as mercenaries, to deal with other problems that the Western imperial court has had to deal with. So he's had this ongoing relationship with the Huns throughout his adult life. In fact, he owes the Huns his current position uh, as commander of the Western Imperial Roman Army because he was fired at one point by the woman who was running Rome. And without Hunnish support, he might never have regained the status that he now possesses. But now, perhaps very uncomfortably, Atias finds himself on the other side of the battle lines. And instead of being able to fight with the Huns or to have them behind him dealing with some problem that he needs to solve, they've become the problem that he needs to solve. And Atias, of all people, knows what a very significant problem this is going to be. Atias is trying to anticipate which route the Huns are going to take towards Italy and the Western Imperial Court. He and his army are encamped near the town of Arles, which is at the mouth of the Rhone River in present-day France. The Bishop of Orléans has just arrived in Atias' camp, having traveled in great haste for many days on horseback without rest to try and reach Atias and beg him to come and save the city of Orléans, which is next on Attila's invasion path. The Huns are moving very fast, even with their heavy siege machinery it's likely that they covered the 330 kilometers from the city of Metz to the city of Orléans in three weeks. Atias is going to have to move very fast to get his army to Orléans ahead of the Huns, and he's going to need some help. In a surprising diplomatic move, Atias approaches the Visigoths, who are another barbarian tribe. In fact, they're a tribe that's been a thorn in the side for the Western Roman Empire for quite a long time. Remember, it was four decades ago that the Visigoths sacked Rome. They invaded, they looted, they took things they wanted, and they kidnapped Galla Placidia, the emperor's sister, and took her away as a hostage. So the Visigoths aren't exactly allies or friends of Rome. They've been a problem for some time. And yet at this moment, Atias is going to need their help if he's got any hope of dealing with the massive army of Huns that are that are barreling towards Italy. 
Atias is in luck because the Visigoths current king, a man named Theodoric, has actually been busy disseminating Roman culture and learning amongst the upper-class Visigoths in his tribe. And so, while politically their interests have been different, Theodoric is quite interested in Roman culture and in increasing the level of civilization, if you like, that the Visigoths have. And so, at this moment, he agrees to help Atias against the Huns, and therefore mobilizes all of his warriors and his own Visigoth army to join with Atias and head at top speed toward Orléans. On the way, Atias also sends messengers to any other smaller barbarian tribes that aren't already aligned with Attila to join him and the Visigoths heading towards Orléans for this massive battle. Now, there are differing accounts of which army reached the city of Orléans first. Some say the Huns arrived first, but if they did, it was only by a matter of hours. What we do know is that when Atias's army and his allies arrive, the Huns are forced out of the city, and they have to retreat away from Orléans, a distance of about 160 miles. They're retreating from the city, looking for a place of open ground where they're going to decide to turn around and face the Roman army. Remember that open ground is where the Hunnish army does best, so they're looking for a battleground on which the odds are in their favor, and they find it. They turn and face the Roman army when they reach open ground, commencing what is sometimes known as the Battle of Tricassus, or Troyes, but most commonly known as the Battle of the Catalonian Plains. It seems likely that after war becomes industrialized, and we have the massive killing machines in World War I and World War II, that we would have bloodier battles than this. But for its time, before the age of modern machinery, it was certainly one of the biggest bloodbaths that had ever been seen. Try to imagine the night before the battle. Thousands of men are camped on either side of the open field. Their torches are flickering in the night, and their leaders are soberly drawing up plans and strategies for the battle the next day. Attila will rely on his highly mobile lines of mounted archers, who, in classic Hun battle tradition, are going to ride full speed at the stationary enemy lines, firing arrows with incredible speed and enough force to puncture armor, before they wheel in front of the enemy line and return to resupply themselves with arrows, while other waves of archers continuously assault and swerve in front of the enemy lines. Attila's objective will be to break through to the center of the enemy force, at which point the archers will not be fighting with bows, but they'll be dealing with much closer hand-to-hand -hand combat. Attila calls on his shamans, or his religious officials, to make sacrifices and to predict what is going to happen the next day. The shamans sacrifice cows and possibly horses. They examine entrails, they look at bones, and they try to foretell the events that are going to unfold. They return to Attila with a prediction. An enemy commander will die in the battle tomorrow. Attila takes the shaman's prediction as an indication that Atias will die in the battle tomorrow. Now, in the Roman camp, as they prepare for the battle to come, Atias knows that the Huns are going to rely on their cascading waves of devastating Hunnish archers. He's fought with them before. This is very familiar. And so Atias arranges his army in a left, a center, and a right wing. And his objective is going to be to cut off the Hunnish archers as they wheel around from the center and head back to their resupply to their resupply wagons, he's going to try to intercept them, to prevent them from reloading, and to cut off the continuous line of attack. The arrangement of the Roman army, in the shape that Atias is now using, would also have suggested to Attila what they had in mind. So both of these commanders have a very good sense of what the strengths of each side are and what the counter-tactics are likely to be. Now, when the two forces began their actual clash, it was a vicious all-day battle. The Hunnish archers failed to break through the center of Atias's army, and at one point they're forced to retreat and to regroup. And it's in this moment that Attila rallies his men with a speech. 
We have this speech from Jordanes, who is an ancient historian, perhaps not quite a contemporary of Attila, but fairly close in time. Jordanes wasn't there in person, of course, so the speech is reconstructed from reports he may have heard and from his own knowledge of Attila's character. It's best to think of these words as attempting to capture the spirit of the man and what he was like. We may imagine that Attila's speech sounded something like this. After you have conquered so many peoples, I would deem it foolish, nay ignorant, of me as your king to goad you with words. What else are you used to but fighting? And what is sweeter for brave men than to seek vengeance personally? Despise this union of discordant races. Look at them as they gather in line with their shields locked, checked not even by wounds but by the dust of battle. On then to the fray. Let courage rise and fury explode. Now show your cunning, Huns, your deeds of arms. Why should heaven have made the Huns victorious over so many, if not to prepare them for the joy of this conflict? Who else revealed to our forefathers the way through the Maotic marshes? Who else made armed men yield to men as yet unarmed? I shall hurl the first spear. If any stand at rest while Attila fights, that man is dead. So there's a mixture here of an appeal to history, of an appeal to the joy of fighting, and also a threat that anyone who, who decides to turn back or refrain from fighting is going to be killed. Even if Attila didn't say these exact words, they are consistent with what we know of his character, which was a mixture of fierce personal loyalty, a love of warfare for its own sake, and also very severe penalties for people who failed to do as they were told. Whatever Attila actually said, his words were very successful in spurring the Huns back to a renewed assault, and the battle went on for many more hours. In fact, until nightfall. Accounts of this battle describe an epic clash in which thousands and thousands of men died. As darkness fell, the fighting ceased for the day. We have to remember, there aren't any lights. When the sun goes down, things become very, very dark out there on the open plain, and it doesn't make sense to continue. So the armies retire to their separate sides of the field to lick their wounds and prepare for the next day. And we have some indication that the Huns began to contemplate the possibility that they would lose. And this would be a first in Attila's history of campaigning. His army has never been defeated in open battle in a clash like this. But we know they begin to think about it because Attila has a heap of wooden saddles assembled. And it's intended to be a funeral pyre. And the purpose is that if it does look like the Huns are going to lose and the battle is turning against them, Attila is going to light this pyre and throw himself on it so that he dies in a blaze of glory. And he's not taken prisoner or giving anyone the pleasure of wounding or killing him. When the sun came up the next day, the battle commenced again, and it raged on for the entire second day. According to some accounts, there was so much blood on the field that warriors who were exhausted by thirst would lean down and drink from the pools of blood that were everywhere on the field. Theodoric, the king of the Visigoths, falls in battle on this second day, and so there are reports that his men pick up his body and carry it off the field, and that behind the battle lines, he's going to be laid out in state and prepared for burial. So there was a king, there was an enemy leader that fell during the Battle of the Catalonian Plains, but so far it's not Atias. Now the Huns were stuck at this point. They're exhausted after two full days of fighting. They are stuck with the river behind them and the enemy army in front of them. So there's nowhere that they can easily retreat to to fight on a different day under different conditions. After two days of fighting, there's been no clear victor. But the Romans can continue this assault really as long as they want to, because the Romans are on home ground, which means they can resupply their army from behind. They can have food and fresh horses and other reinforcements arrive to ensure that they can continue their attack 
But Attila and his men are stuck. They have whatever provisions that they happen to be carrying with them. There's no hope of resupply. So in effect, their army is almost under siege. They're pinned down, they're stationary, and they could even be trapped here and starved out if that is the strategy that Atias decides to pursue. The grimness of the picture that the Huns are looking out on is, ha is very hard for us to imagine. If you try to see this battlefield after the second day of fighting, you have to imagine that it's absolutely covered in the mangled and dead bodies of men and horses. Not all of them are dead, of course, so you'll be hearing the groans and the shrieks and the sobs of men who are stuck out there under heaps of other bodies, crying out for water, crying out for someone to come and slit their throats and put them out of their misery. So there's a, horr there's a horrifying soundtrack and the visuals of this carnage that are laid out in front of the Hunnish army. So how many exactly died? It's a good question. Reports from ancient historians report a figure like 180,000 dead as the cumulative total from both armies over the two days. Historian John Mann points out that figures this large are quite unlikely at a time when cities had populations between two and 5,000, and there just simply wouldn't have been enough food in the countryside to sustain armies of such size marching along on campaign. So it's quite common for modern historians to take ancient casualty numbers and reduce them down to about 10%. It's safer to assume that each of the armies was closer to 25,000 men each. Even if we assume that a third of the men on both sides died, we get a total casualty rate of about 15,000 dead men. That is a lot of corpses. For comparison, the Normandy Memorial Cemetery near Omaha Beach, which contains some of the bodies of soldiers who attacked during D-Day, houses 10,000 dead. This cemetery is 172 acres. To bury 15,000 men with the same amount of space that exists in that cemetery would take 257 acres of land. And a single acre is roughly the size of an American football field with the end zone cut off. So imagine 250 American football fields. That is the amount of land it would take to bury all of these men at a regular cemetery distancing. Of course, the men on this battlefield are not all neatly laid out and evenly spaced from each other. They're lying jumbled in piles of men and horses and weapons all over the place. The birds are beginning to descend to feed on the bodies of the dead. And as the night falls on the second day, the Hunnish army is looking out grim and exhausted over this field of death. You would think that with the Huns pinned down and desperate, this would be the moment for Atias to seize victory. It's the obvious thing to do, after all. The Huns have been a problem not just for the Western Roman Empire, but the Eastern one as well. And yet, things are about to take a shocking turn. Atias decides to persuade his Visigoth allies and his Frankish allies to leave the battlefield. The Visigoths want to finish the job. They want to get in there and absolutely destroy the Hunnish army so that they are no longer a fighting force that anyone has to worry about for some years to come. But somehow Atias manages to persuade them that this is not the right thing to do. After all, he says to the young Visigoth prince who's now in charge, your father, the king, has just died on this battlefield, and you're probably going to be dealing with a struggle for succession. If you want to make sure that the kingly crown stays on your own head, you'd better get on home and assert your right to be the next king of the Visigoths. And to the Franks, Atias says something similar. He says, listen, the Hunnish army, whatever's left of them, is going to be retreating back towards Hungary and Central Europe. And on their way, they're going to be passing through your territories, which are vulnerable. You'd best turn around, head back, and fortify your own areas to make sure that 
they don't get damaged as this army begins to recede. Now, Atias himself was likely thinking something a little bit different. He's probably thinking that he might need the Huns again in the future to sort of hold the balance of power between the Roman Empire and all the competing other tribes that are jockeying for position and territory and wealth. The Huns have been useful to Atias before, and he's got a shrewd sense that they might be useful to him again, so he doesn't want to completely destroy them and take them out of the game. Atias may actually be worried about the Visigoths, who've been an ongoing problem for the Roman Empire for many years, and he might need to turn around and use the Huns in the not-too-distant future to deal with the Visigoths and threats that they might pose. It doesn't suit Atias's long-term strategy to completely annihilate the Huns, although he probably kept this entirely to himself. So suddenly, everything is silent. The third day arrives, and the sun comes up, and the Huns are looking up from behind their, their fortifications and their tents. They're looking out over the field of battle, and they don't see an enemy army encamped on the other side of it. They don't hear enemy horses, or pots and pans, or anything that sounds like an encampment of men anywhere nearby. Where have they gone? It's very, very disconcerting. And the Huns must certainly have thought that it's a false retreat, that Atias and the Visigoths have simply removed themselves from the field, they've retreated a little ways out of sight, hoping to draw the Huns after them, and then, in a maneuver that would have been quite familiar to the Huns themselves, these Romans would turn around and cut them down. So this is what the Huns must have suspected when they looked around and found this unexpected absence. So they wait, and they wait for hours, possibly even a couple of days. But eventually, the strange silence that continues is enough to convince them that the enemy army has indeed left. And they begin to pick up their camp, remove their fortifications, and prepare themselves to move. They begin a retreat back towards the east and their territorial base in Hungary. This is the first battlefield defeat that Attila's army has ever experienced. But the army hasn't been destroyed. They've lost men, but there are enough soldiers who remain alive and well that the army is still a significant force. They haven't been destroyed entirely because of Atias' unexpected intervention on their behalf. This means that the Huns are going to remain a powerful force, and Atias will soon be blamed for not taking the opportunity to break them. The Huns retreat back home, and they lick their wounds for a year and a half. The Roman Empire is wary, wondering what's going to happen next. The Hunnish emissaries don't come as frequently. They're not sure what is going to happen. But within two years of the Battle of the Catalonian Plains, Attila's men are out raiding again. And they have to be, because their entire power structure depends on regular raids and the collection of booty and wealth to maintain the lines of loyalty between various tribal chieftains and Attila himself. And within two years of that battle, Attila's army is actually in northern Italy. I can only imagine what the Western imperial court must have thought of this, and no doubt Attias was taking a lot of heat. He'd had the opportunity to destroy these Huns two years ago, he hadn't done so, and now they were back, not just in France, but in Italy itself, taking things from cities that are supposed to be under the protection of Rome. The Huns besiege the wealthy Italian glass-making town of Aquileia, and then they continue along the northern edge of Italy, looting cities like Padua and Verona, even Milan. It seemed likely that Attila and his army were about to turn south and possibly conduct a raid on the imperial city itself. The very center of the Western Roman Empire was threatened. It was at this moment that Pope Leo I led a delegation to meet with Attila and attempt to negotiate to prevent such an attack. When Attila met the Roman delegation, we don't have a clear record of what he said, but we can construe it based on the sort of things that he normally said. He's likely to have demanded his fiancée, the imperial princess Honoria, again, to be handed over to him 
to be married, and with her, large chunks of the Western Roman Empire. And Pope Leo would have had the unhappy job of telling Attila that Honoria was unavailable because she'd already been married off, but that wealth could change hands to persuade Attila to turn his army around and go back east. Various pious accounts of this meeting between Attila and the Pope claim that Attila saw the figure of a large and muscular man behind Pope Leo I, possibly an angel, and that this angel menaced Attila and persuaded him to turn around and leave Italy alone. This seems quite unlikely. After all, Attila would have had several other good reasons to call off any further invasion of Italy. His army had been in Italy during the summer, and plague was very common. Quite a number of his soldiers had fallen sick, and many of them had died. So the risk of continuing in Italy in this heat, with the conditions of disease that were so easily developing, would have been greater than the potential reward. His army was weakening as a result of this infection, and perhaps it seemed to him the best plan was to take the gold that the Pope was very eagerly offering him and turn his soldiers around and cut his losses. After all, his supply lines were going to be longer and more precarious the deeper that he ventured into Roman territory, and he'd also be vulnerable from attack from behind, because the Eastern Roman Emperor could also send forces that might come in when they were least expected and cut off Attila's army from their necessary sources of food and resupply. Whatever the details of the actual promises made, Pope Leo managed to make an offer that Attila was persuaded to accept. He had enough gold to pay off his chieftains, to call the campaign a success, and with that, he decided to turn his army around and march back to Hungary. The Italian campaign turned out to be the farthest west that Attila was ever going to go. So what happened to him? This fearsome warlord who shook the foundations of the Roman Empire itself. He met a sudden and unexpected end. Only months after he returned home from this very campaign in Italy in the year 453. It seems that Attila had just added another woman to his collection of wives when he returned home. Her name was Ildico, and she was a Germanic princess, probably sent as a gift to him to cement some sort of tribal alliance. Reports have it that she was a young and beautiful woman, and she had just celebrated her wedding with Attila, who was now in his mid-fifties. So after the formalities, there would have been the customary wedding feast. There would have been lots of food and lots of alcohol, because the Huns, like many other steppe tribes, were notorious drinkers. Reports say that Attila had been drinking heavily throughout the celebrations, and then retired to his bedroom with his new wife to consummate the marriage. The next morning, several hours passed, and Attila hadn't been seen. He hadn't emerged from his bedroom. So eventually, people began to ask some questions. And some of his most loyal lieutenants knocked on his door, and getting no answer, they broke in to his bedroom. And there they found Attila lying dead, and his young wife, Ildico, crying. There were no cuts on Attila's body, no signs of force, but a good amount of blood flowing from his nose and his mouth and pooling on the floor. How did he die? Was he assassinated? Surely this would have been their immediate suspicion, that this young Germanic bride was sent on an assassination mission to finish the King of the Huns. After all, it wouldn't be the first time that a woman had taken advantage of a man overly relaxed in a post-coital haze to end his life. Perhaps she'd used poison in his wine. All of these are doubtless theories that would have raced through the minds of Attila's closest men. But we don't have any evidence that Ildico was there to murder Attila. Because if they had even the slightest shred of credible reason to believe she had, she certainly would have met a grisly end. And we don't get any record of that in the accounts of this night, many of which we have from Priscus, who was in the Hunnish camp at the time. However, John Mann, in his excellent book Attila, suggests another explanation for the symptoms around Attila's death. 
He suggests that Attila may have had a peptic ulcer, which could have broken during the night and induced vomiting. But since Attila was unconscious due to heavy drinking, this vomiting would have resulted in him choking and dying. John Mann's other theory is related to serious and chronic drinking. This behavior can, over time, cause the development of varicose veins in the throat, and these may have burst without warning, thus producing the rush of blood through Attila's throat and nose. Uh, once again, this would have choked him to death in his unconscious state. And there's something ironic about the fact that a man who caused so much blood to be shed would have choked to death on his own. Attila was buried in secret, and this was a custom that was well established to preserve his dignity and to prevent grave robbery. There are grandiose legends of Attila being buried in a triple coffin, one of steel, one of silver, and one of gold over top. But this would have required ludicrous amounts of these precious metals in far larger quantities than the Huns are likely to have had. And even if they did have this much gold, we can hardly expect that they would have been so foolish as to bury it all. Instead, he was probably buried in a coffin with ceremonial decorations that were made of gold or other precious metals. To preserve secrecy, the grave may have been dug by a small group of slaves at night. Remember, Huns had slaves as prisoners of war, so they may well have used some of them to dig the hole that was going to be required. The coffin would be lowered in, the hole would be covered, and then these slaves would have been executed by a handful of Attila's closest men who were supervising the operation. In this way, only they would know where Attila actually lay, and there would be no chance of a rumor or betrayal of where he actually was buried. The slaves themselves would then have been executed by a handful of Attila's closest men who were supervising the operation. And this would ensure that the secret of where Attila laid lay only with a few of his closest and most trusted friends. Legend has it that Attila was buried in the Tisa River in Hungary, and this would have required them to divert the course of the river during the night to allow the space to dig a hole in the riverbed, and when the hole was covered over and the slaves executed, the river would have been allowed to flow back over its usual course, thus forever washing away any sign of the burial and Attila himself. At this point in the story, if you're like me, you may have been wondering, what happened to Atias? I mean, he wasn't a Hun, but he's one of the most fascinating characters in this story. A man who straddles the world of both high imperial Roman politics and actually fighting in the field and living with the Huns themselves, and someone who was able to have alliances and enmity in both directions. So how does he end? Well, the answer is he didn't much outlive Attila. In fact, he died within a year. It seems that Atias had risen so high in the echelons of imperial power that several people began to view him again as a threat. Reports indicate that Atias was a very capable military leader and a diplomat, and that because he was very, very good at what he did, he was in fact managing most of the important strategic decisions and parts of the government as well. The Emperor Valentinian was a bit of a playboy. He wasn't as focused on these sorts of things and spent most of his time in pleasurable activities and amusing himself. So when some of his counselors came to him and began to whisper that Atias had become too powerful, too strong, and too influential, he decided to do something about it. In 454, Emperor Valentinian summoned Atias to an audience with him at the imperial court in Ravenna, and he required Atias to give an official report on various financial matters and matters of state, which wouldn't have been an unusual summons. After Atias had given his report in person to the emperor, Emperor Valentinian stood up and he formally accused Atias of conspiracy and treachery. Then the emperor struck several blows to Atias' head and killed him. Thus died one of the most skillful Roman generals and diplomats, 
a man who had successfully balanced the dangerous and competing interests of Rome and in barbarian tribes for decades. One of the emperor's counselors, when Emperor Valentinian asked for an opinion of what he had just done, reportedly looked down and said, I don't know if it's right or wrong, but the emperor has just cut off his right hand. Retribution wasn't long to follow. Atias was a man who inspired so much loyalty that some of his barbarian soldiers murdered Emperor Valentinian himself in revenge for the killing of their favorite general. So within two years of the epic battle of the Catalonian Plains that had seen Atias and the armies of Rome square off against Attila and the Huns, Attila was dead, Atias had been murdered, and Emperor Valentinian himself was assassinated. Attila has remained alive in popular imagination centuries after his death. In Hungary, his name is still commonly given to boys, and he remains a sort of forefather of a nation that Hungarians have claimed for themselves. The terror that the scourge of God inspired in Europe suggests that people viewed him as a form of divine punishment, both because of the severity of the damage that he caused and how little they felt they could do to stop him. He was certainly a remarkable individual who was able to rise to the top of a very dangerous hierarchy in Hunnish society, and able to balance the demands for wealth amongst his warrior chieftains against the risks of getting that wealth without complete disaster. He inspired loyalty and fear, perhaps in equal measure, amongst his subordinates, and his rule represents the high water mark for the power of the Hunnish tribal confederacy. After Attila died, the Huns themselves experienced a dramatic decline. First, there was a struggle for power amongst his three sons. The tribal confederacy that the Huns had become was welded together through lines of personal loyalty to Attila himself. And many of these men had been the independent chieftains or kings of their own tribes. So they were part of the Hunnish confederation because Attila had made them so, but they were very fierce and very independent men in their own right, and they weren't amenable to being divided up and inherited by Attila's sons. So what happened was that many of these warrior chieftains rose up and demanded independence for themselves and their tribes. One of the more powerful tribes in the confederation, the Gepids, led a rebellion against the Huns to win back their freedom. An enormous battle was fought on the plains of Central Europe, and thousands of Huns died, including Attila's oldest son, Elak. The Gepids won their independence, not only killing Attila's heir, but with him, the idea of the Hunnish confederacy itself. The Huns and their tribal allies fragmented settling into different, smaller territories under their own independent leaders, thus ending the massive threat that together they had been able to pose to Europe and the Roman world. This brings us to the end of our mini-series on Attila the Hun. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe to the podcast and consider sharing it with someone else who enjoys history. You can listen to this episode or the previous ones as an audio podcast anywhere you stream podcasts, and you can find the illustrated version on my YouTube channel and on Instagram at Eva Schubert.